Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Now verse number 18 in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And that's something that the Apostle Paul was stressing to the church at Corinth. Now, if we have any understanding and knowledge of the church of Corinth, it had the same characteristics in it that uh, most churches today have in them, and that is that uh, uh, the people that attended there felt they were called by God to criticize anything and everything that came their way in the measure of instruction. However, there were those of solid uh, belief and faith in the Lord that walked in the wonderful Word of God and the Spirit of the Lord, and they were determined uh, to weed that out of the uh, main course of things in their church and uh, to get down to business with what uh, God really had to say to His people there. Go with me now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? The Apostle Paul had been teaching the church at Corinth that uh, the important thing for them to do is to walk in the righteousness and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, they were having arguments, and as uh, we find still goes on today, in uh, the churches that try to preach the word, there's always someone there that wants to say, I don't think that's right, I, I think this, or I think that. And that had been going on for a while, and so now Paul writes to them, and so he has to uh, uh, send forth his instruction and guidance to them, uh, by writing it down. Thank God he did because we have it today for our benefit as well. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. So we have the argument going on uh, within the congregation about well I believe this. Well, no, I don't think that's right. I believe this, somebody else says. And then there are those that say nothing, but they go away with a confused mind, and they don't know who's right and who's wrong, and they wonder whether or not they even need to go back to church. Well, we have the same stuff going on today in our churches who try to preach the Word of God. So what's the point here? Jesus Christ is saying unto them, Look, you have to recognize that if you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, that you're going to have to take on the nature of Christ, and you have to recognize that the Holy Spirit is telling the Apostle Paul to and look at this and to give them instruction as they were arguing back and forth one with another. And thus we had the words in verse 14 and what Paul is saying just makes sense. If Christ uh, uh, is our judge, then we have to come to the conclusion that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Well, what was the big argument over? Oh, we can't allow any of the Gentiles to come in here. This is a closed church. This is a church that's just to be set apart unto God, and we're the only ones that God has any dealings with. Same stuff goes on in the 21st century, right here in America today. Same arguments. And Paul said, hey, wait a minute. We look at this and we... Meditate in the Lord, and we ask God for direction of the Holy Spirit, and He says, 
we are constrained by Christ, the love of Christ. And because of that, we feel compelled to tell you what it is really like and what you're supposed to understand. And that is, if we are uh, to judge what we're to believe is what he's saying, that if one died for all, and they were readily accepting that, well, you know, Jesus died for all, but, you know, it's always that little three-letter word, but, that gets people in trouble, isn't it? And what happens? But it don't apply to this group over here, and it doesn't apply to that group over there, and I'm not so sure this group over there, they're getting close uh, to the purity of the word, but they're not quite there yet. And so we're just not going to do anything but stick with, we are the only ones that God came to do anything good for. Now, wait a minute, Paul says. If you're going to take that rationale, you're going to have to discard the whole Word of God. Because the Bible plainly states that what God gave unto Israel was also available, especially after Jesus paid for our sin and died for it on the cross of Calvary and rose again the third day, the only begotten Son of God that was the sacrificial Lamb of God that paid the price for all who would believe. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are those of these other churches that you have some question about that declare they believe. And as a result of that, they now have the opportunity to accept the same benefits that Jesus gave to the chosen people of God, the household of Israel, the followers and the inheritors from Abraham and Isaac. And as a result now, Paul is trying to put this confrontation uh, to rest uh, and settle them in on something that's more important. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see, there's always those within any gathering of people that think they know more than anybody else, that feel like that they have the right to speak up and to take the position that they're absolutely sure that they know all about, and uh, nobody else could be right because after all, I know I'm right and this is what I believe and if you don't agree with me, then there's a big problem because I'm not sure you belong in our gathering. The people who claim to be Christians today are filled with the same things that the church of Corinth was battling when Paul had to confront them. Verse 16, Wherefore? Henceforth, from now on, in other words, in our modern language, know we no man after the flesh. We're not interested in the opinion and the positions of the carnal mind and the carnal flesh of those who want to be important in the body of Christ, but really don't know how and have not yet come to the place where they know and understand the spiritual work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he accomplished for them at the cross, the resurrection, and the ascension to be with the Heavenly Father. And so Paul says, you need to know that I'm not going to take any stand with any of the opposition because you're confused and everybody has his own idea. I'm going to tell you what the Word of God says and what God intends for us to do and what He intends for us to be. Verse 17, Therefore, and here's the clincher, if any man be in Christ, Oh, you all claim to be Christians? But you don't believe Jesus is part of your standing before the Heavenly Father? Oh, wait a minute. So we go on. And he says, if any man be in Christ, 
He is a new creature. You are arguing out of the insights and the understanding and the philosophy of the human mind, carnal mind, and carnal body. And what needs to happen, and if you haven't experienced this yet, Paul goes on to explain later, you need to come to the place where you need to be born again, like Jesus said. And you need to become a new creature. And so he says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, 17 now, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. God has created him and renewed him to a position that he never attained because he, he was born with the carnal mind and the carnal body. We have to understand that something has to happen in you before you can become what Jesus Christ really wants you to become and how you want to fit in his kingdom. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now you'll notice that the text today is entitled, Forget Your Past. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because uh, especially in this area of uh, especially in this era of this terrible virus that's going around which uh, may or may not be terrible at all because actually when we begin to learn what is going on and what's in it uh, I want you to know you need to be careful and know what you're doing being vaccinated or not that's your decision but I want to tell you that uh, when we get cleansed by the Word of God in our mind and we get renewed by the Word of God in our normal, natural, carnal, human spirit that God gave us when we were conceived, then we need to come to a point where we begin to make some decisions that will stop all this bickering and going forth in your midst and we'll get down to business with things that are important. So in verse 18 it says, you need to know that all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now as you look at that, you begin to think, because you're still natural, because you still got a carnal mind, you begin to think, well, that don't make sense. I don't understand how that can be. And you're like the people that talked to Jesus and said, how can a man be born again? He can't enter into his mother's womb and uh, be born again. That's stupid. Well, of course it is. If it's carnal, if it's natural, but you see, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he died to reconcile us. That means to restore us to what God intended man to be when he created Adam before Adam blew it and caused sin to arrive in so many people thereafter. Therefore, all things are of God, and he hath restored us, reconciled us, unto himself. We had no intimate relationship with the Father until we were reconciled. And when we were reconciled, God, through the work that Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, did for us as a sacrificial lamb, was to break the bondage of the law of sin and death that had been established when Adam sinned. Wow. And so now he says, when you accept Jesus Christ and you really believe what he is and what he said and what he declares and all the power that God gave him to minister God's word to us, when you come to that point, then you are at a place where you can begin to understand what is meant when we say unto you, all things are become new. 
Now, I want to just leave that thought there for a moment. I want to talk to you about things that are going on today. In the last two years, nearly everyone I talk to, whether they're Christians or whether they aren't, uh, whether they are uh, faithfully uh, serving the Lord as born-again believers and are doing uh, the best they can to serve the Lord in their own understanding of it and all of that, uh, or whether they're just uh, totally disinterested in spiritual things because the carnal mind cannot possibly uh, coordinate the thoughts of anybody being set free uh, through the blood of Christ that died and rose again and lived again for us. But we can. And so God said, you need to understand that all things have become new, as the Apostle Paul was again referring to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he taught here in this old world. Now, I started out to tell you about what's going on today in talking to so many people. And, and here's a common phrase, and the reason I'm giving this message to you today is because so many of you are mothers with children that are either newborn all the way up until they're 60 or 70 years old, and you, by the grace of God, are still uh, blessed by God to still be here with them. But the question comes up, Pastor, I'm a failure. Pastor, I was not a good mom. I was not a good parent. Pastor, I don't know what's gone wrong, but my kids, they've gone off the deep end. They're off into all these different mystical doctrines that are going around today. They don't want to listen to me or anybody else. And they're a mess. And I'm a failure. Well, why are you a failure? Well, you know, when I was young like they are, I was a very nice person. I did some sinning. I failed. I knew I wasn't supposed to do what I did, but I did some things that I thought would be fun, but they ended up being a terrible burden, and I can't forget them. Can't forget my past. Why? Well, there's two reasons, maybe three or four or five, I don't know. But the two reasons I want to talk about today is number one, you may not have been born again. You may have received an intellectual understanding of the plan of God, but you never allowed it to get into your spirit and you did not repent. Well, I ask God to forgive me every time I sinned. Well, that was the problem. Asking God to forgive you is just simply acknowledging that you sinned. Well, what does repent mean? Repent means that, Lord, I want you to forgive me, but you also have to say, I want you to cleanse me. Now, if he's going to cleanse you, he has to do something inside of you. What does he do inside of you? He makes you a new, reconciled vessel of purity in the eyes of Almighty God the Father because Jesus bought you out of the prison of the bondage of law and sin and death. Oh, we all have to die in the old carnal body. That's a blessing if you're a child of God. When you leave this old carnal body, you're going to be instantly with the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever he is, in the portals of heaven or down here on the face of this earth. Well, we don't see him in person on this earth yet, physically, but we surely do see him in spiritual life and lifestyle. And so what's happened to you? You have grown in your carnal nature, your carnal mind, your understanding of right and wrong, and you've come to that place where now as you recognize that your children are going through things that are much worse than what you ever faced in your day, and you can't get through to them. And so what happens? 
Oh, Satan is sitting right there listening to you. And he's going to pump it into you. You can't do anything with your kids. You're a failure. You know good and well that there's no way they can change. Look at you and all at once. All of the stuff that you thought was so much fun has become such a sour note and putrefying thought and experience in your life as you look back upon them and you feel that the old devil is right when he tells you and you can't do anything about it. Well, he's a liar. The Jesus said he was a liar from the very beginning and he'll be a liar always until he's put in a place where he cannot exercise his terrible deeds any longer. And that time's coming. Well, now, what are we going to believe? If you have really been born again into the kingdom of God, let me put it in the terminology of the Apostle Paul. If you have been reconciled unto God, that means that you have literally been born again, not in your intellect, because God tells us, the Lord tells us, that as long as we live in this body, we're going to have a natural intellect and we're going to have a natural body. And it's going to want to rule our lives. But when we became, as it were, reconciled and brought back into harmony with the Spirit of the Heavenly Father, we find ourselves in a position where now we can live and think and act not according to the law of our old carnal nature and carnal mind, but according to the righteousness and the purity and the holiness, the love and the goodness of Almighty God and our Lord and Redeemer, Jesus the Christ. And we can discipline the carnal nature that we have in our mind and in our body. And how can we do that? Because being reconciled with God, we have communication with the Heavenly Father through His Spirit. And we have insight into the Word of God through His Spirit and through the Word that the Bible tells us is a living Word. If we live by it, we'll live forever in the Kingdom of God. And as a result, it is therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Now why do I want you to forget your past? I want you to remember the good things, the miracle working things, the times that in your the stupidity and ignorance of carnality and sin that God literally protected you and you didn't even know he was anywhere around. But there as you look back, you see where God protected you. I may have mentioned this in past time, I don't know, but I often have spoken with uh, men who were involved in World War II and then uh, in uh, Korea and then in Vietnam and now in all of the Middle East nations in one way or another. And what's happened? I've got three people that have shared with me that even though they are born again, they serve the Lord, they live a godly life, they cannot forget what happened to them in all of these wars separately. And they come home, they can't forget. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. And I'm sure I don't. You don't understand. I was uh, uh, the only one that came out of the battle. Every other soldier that was there in my particular group was killed or so badly wounded that they were carried off the field. I can't understand why I'm still here. I should have been with them. Well, that's what the old devil wants you to believe. But you see, God had you marked 
before you ever knew it, when you were conceived, he had a purpose for you. And even though you rebelled against him, and you had to go do what the uh, government told you you had to do in warfare, and you went through the whole thing, you need to understand something, that uh, that is not you anymore if you've been born again. But I'm the only one that came out alive. And the anguish that these men still go through until just recently, I hope, they have gotten over it. One said to me, there was two of us alive. Helicopter came in. We were surrounded by enemy fire. There was bullets flying in every direction. The helicopter came in, threw its doors open, and pulled uh, uh, one of us in, and they were pulling the other one in, and he was shot and killed while he was getting through the doorway, and he never made it. And I came out, and I can't understand why it was me. And I had the privilege of saying to him, because God had called you and had ordained you to be a person in His kingdom that would glorify His name and minister to others. But I didn't even know the Lord, he said. But the Lord knew you. Oh. You think about that for a moment. And as you do, you begin to understand. Most people today started out getting married, looking forward to having their own family and having children, looking forward to being able to enjoy rearing that family. And they had uh, dreams of a great ambition and and the ability of their children to uh, succeed and to be comfortable in this world, live a godly life, only to discover that they have rejected the Lord and they have not responded to the tutoring and the teaching of the parent. And I want to just tell you something. Mom, are you listening to me today? This don't sound like the Mother's Day message, but it is. And I want to tell you something. You need to forget the failures that you had. Yes, you may have done some things you should not have done. And yes, you may have uh, been an a enemy of God for a long time. But you have come to know the Lord. And you are now changed by the reconciliation, reconciliation, that God granted unto you through the blood of the Lord Jesus that died for your sin. And what does the Apostle say to us? When Christ came in and became part of our inner spirit, He severed the law of sin and death from the spirit that we were born with, and he implanted righteousness and purity and holiness and the ability to fellowship, communicate, and look to our Heavenly Father as our Heavenly Father and realize that he is the greatest of all fathers that ever was or ever will be and that he is our Father today. And if he is your father today, then I want to tell you, Jesus Christ is your Lord, he's your coming king, and he is your fellow son of God. Maybe I should put it this way. And we all who have come to know him as Lord are all fellow sons of God. Because we're part of his kingdom. And if we live as he has given us to live, if we have really repented and turned from the old lifestyle, if we have done that, then what does it say? And I want to stress it again. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Your history, your activities, your guilty things that you did you shouldn't have done, and even the good things that you did do, everything is passed away when you allow Jesus Christ to take you in as a fellow saint of God who has repented, been born again, and come to live in the power of the Spirit and the Word of the living God in that Jesus made it very plain when he ascended into the heavens, I have left the Holy Spirit with you here. I, I was here as a man. But I've left the Holy Spirit here with you now. And he's everywhere present. And he's at your beck and call. And he watches over, protects, delivers. And the stuff of the past that was guilt on your conscience and on your spirit has been wiped away. It's no longer in the record books of heaven. Verse 18, all things are of God now, who hath reconciled us. I know, and this third time I've talked about it. But what did he do? He, he reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the price that God paid to take us away from the damnation and terrible activities of satanic forces of darkness. Jesus Christ was the light of the world. Yeah, he was of the word of God in the world and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, Paul said. To wit, verse 19, that was uh, the next thing that Paul dealt with. To wit, that God was in Christ. Now here again, those of you who are determined to say that Jesus Christ was God is not true. Jesus Christ was a man that God was in. Just as God will be in you when you become reconciled unto God through the blood and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Therefore, he does not impute their trespasses unto them, and hath, been, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Before we were born again, and we're not born again until the Spirit of Jesus Christ severs the Spirit of darkness and evil and ungodliness and uh, unwholesomeness that we inherited under the law of sin, we need to recognize that we are on a level with Christ, the man. Oh, but he's the king of kings. Well, is he going to be the king of kings as God? No. He's going to be the king of kings as men, as a man. Filled with the word of God. And the more of the word of God you and I can get in us, the better off we'll be, and the closer we'll walk with God, and the more we will acknowledge and understand the work of reconciliation that took place in our heart when we said, Yes, Lord, I'm guilty. I want you to forgive me. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to take away all of my sin. And you believe that he did. Then why are you still remembering it? Because Satan won't let you forget it. He wants to attack you in the carnal line 
that you understand and you need to walk in the spirit spiritual line that Christ has given unto you through God the Father and recognize that you can control and put down the carnality of the carnal mind and the carnal flesh of our existence on this world today. That's going to change one of these days and we're going to be different people in a glorious, glorious way. God does not impute our trespasses unto us. That, do, that means he doesn't remember them. He doesn't charge us with, their, with our failure. He erases the record clean. The day you took Jesus Christ as your Lord, you had the power and the installation of the righteousness of Jesus, the man, Yes, Jesus the Lord, but Jesus the man. And uh, I know I've got some close friends that think I'm terrible for stick making these statements, but until we understand that a, a man that was like Adam, yes, the Bible says he was like Adam, he had the same ability to sin that Adam had, but he never did it. He was faithful. He kept the Word of God. He gave the Word of God. He ministered the ways of God and the gifts of God and the power of God. Demonstrated the perfection of a holy heavenly Father unto all who would believe. What happens? Paul says, now then, under these circumstances, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador. What does an ambassador do? He gets an office in some other country, and uh, he's a foreigner in that country. And so the ambassador comes and says, uh, I'm Ambassador so-and-so, I represent the U.S. government, and I'm here to explain to you uh, how uh, I can help you and how the government will help you. Uh, we will have a certain agreement between uh, our country and your country, and we pledge this and we pledge that, and we give unto you this X number of billions of dollars to help you out of the realm of disaster and warfare that you've gone through and we'll help you rebuild your country and all of that and and oh yes uh, we're going to have our people coming and visiting your people and and we're going to be their legal representative while they're here in your country but in exchange we expect you to do the same as you send people into our country and we'll honor that and uh, uh, so it's going to be an agreement that will help us all. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? What do we find as ambassadors for Christ? When the spirit of righteousness came into us and broke the law of sin upon us that forced us to do things, act upon things, believe things, and live a corrupt life, uh, impure and ungodly, that is changed, that's cut away. And this righteousness of Jesus Christ abides within our spirit. Yes, it is still in a carnal body and a carnal mind. But the work that Jesus did for us on his venture here, where he paid the price for all of us, he had a carnal spirit and a carnal mind. What? Well... Jesus didn't have the body that God gave him. Jesus had the body that Mary gave him. Well, what was the difference? Well, Mary was implanted with a pure, holy, righteous seed that she would develop a body for to minister to God's people here on this earth who would believe upon him. I hope that makes an understanding for you. So as ambassadors, we had ought to be saying, hey, and thank God in all of the 
terrible stuff that's going on round about us today. We are seeing people come out and they're saying, you left Jesus Christ out of it. Oh, you talk about God. Well, everybody talks about God, but what God is your God? They all have their own gods, remember? Uh, they set the image of him in the backyard or the front yard or on a place in the household where it's uh, audibly seen. We have this God and that God supposed to have supernatural ability. Strange thing is, the only thing they ever bring forth is something that's corruptible. And it may look good and be feeling good for a season, but the end conclusion is because it is a law. It is the fruit of sin. And the fruit of sin is never going to bring forth goodness. It's going to, it's going to bring forth eternal death and damnation and judgment. That's all it will bring forth. But oh... The grace of God and the love of God and the righteousness and the obedience of Jesus Christ. The only begotten Son of God. Begotten why? Because He was begotten by the seed of the Holy Spirit. Created miraculously in Mary. Mary faithful unto that responsibility gave birth to him with a sinless human body. Human? Yes. Why human? Because it could be destructed. It could be killed. And it was killed. And it was destructed. But because of the Spirit of God, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and the righteousness of the Heavenly Father in Him. Now, what happens? We're set free from the bondage of the law of sin. But we don't act like it sometimes. More and more people are saying, I heard you talk about God. I heard you talk about this God and that God and another God. And of course we've got the false gods uh, leaders all gathering together and getting together in their conventions and whatever you want to call them around the world. And they get together and, and uh, uh, have uh, uh, excitement about what they've accomplished, I guess, uh, through their false gods. But you see, it's all nothing more than the law of sin and death that was born into this world through Adam. If you're converted, you're not going to be backward about saying, Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my deliverer. Jesus is my Lord and King and ruler and leader. But he's going to spend eternity, first of all, a thousand years on this planet, ruling over this nation with others who serve the Lord. Now, how does this happen? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh, you mean Jesus was had the ability to sin if he if he wanted to? Absolutely. He hath made him to be sin for us. Not only did he have a natural body and a natural mind, he also became our sin and God made it very plain in his word, if one man can bring this into the world, well, I don't agree with you, Pastor. I think sin was here long before man was created. 
Well, believe what you want to believe. God says it wasn't. And I can prove it. Well, then go on from here. What did he do? He refused to know sin. He refused to compromise the Word of God, the power of God, the purity, holiness, righteousness, perfection of God that he bore in his vessel that was the vessel of a human being just as Adam was and all of his descendants. With that, folks, it's time for us to go to communion. Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to begin reading with verse 23. For I received of the Lord, which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night and when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often, verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Needs in order to be preserved and helped by the Lord Jesus Christ through the whipping that he took at the whipping post. So with that understanding, let us take it and eat it together. Now we take the cup. It holds grape juice, red grape juice, because it represents the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we drink of it, we need to say thank you, Jesus. But we also need to say thank you, Father, because it was the love of the Father that created Jesus with the life for the human flesh that Mary would build around it. And so when Jesus spilled that blood for us, he broke the bondage, the captivity of the law of sin that no one can escape except through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us drink together. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene 
at gene with a G-E-N-E, gene at christianliving101.org.